I ended the first part of this lecture with this question, and so now let's have a look at how you answer it. The first thing to notice is that this positive charge with charge Q on it has six lines coming out. And so that's the convention for the diagram, that a charge of plus six corresponds to six lines. Well, now we have to count the total number of lines passing through this surface, remembering that we have to add the number of lines out to negative the number of lines in. So there are one, two lines coming out, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines going in, and so our total flux is two minus eight, or negative six. And since six lines corresponds to positive Q, negative six corresponds to an enclosed charge of negative Q inside this surface. It might be instructive to see how I put this diagram together. If I remove this surface that's hiding the amount of charge in there, you can see how I set it up. There's a negative 2q charge here and a positive q charge here, and so indeed the total enclosed charge is negative q, and you can verify for yourself that there are six lines coming out of this positive q and 12 lines going into this negative 2q, and so I've drawn the diagram correctly. But one thing for you to try out is try some different surfaces that all enclose these two charges. So you can try a surface like this, or you could do a weird shaped surface like this. And although the number of lines out and in will differ for these different surfaces, you're always going to come up with a total flux of negative six, no matter what surface you draw, as long as it encloses these two charges. What we've just seen and used to solve a simple problem is an informal statement of Gauss's law. Basically, our current statement is that the flux through a closed surface is equal, or at least proportional, because it's arbitrary, to the enclosed charge inside the surface. This is a good conceptual picture of Gauss's law. We're going to have a more formal statement, and most of what's going to be dealt with in that more formal statement is dealing with all the proportionalities, and that largely comes down to thinking about units, so that we can get a charge in a useful set of units like Coulomb's. But this informal idea of Gauss's law is really the better thing to understand in terms of the, the content of Gauss's law. The formal statement of Gauss's law, however, is going to be a very powerful tool for us to calculate electric field magnitudes. I'm going to finish up this lecture by using this informal idea of Gauss's law to demonstrate something that I've claimed but haven't shown. I previously claimed that the field due to a charged sphere is the same as the field due to a charged particle, but I haven't proved it, and the reason I haven't proved it is that to do that, setting up the integrals like we did in the electric field unit is very difficult. However, we'll see that just this informal statement of Gauss's law is enough to do it. So first of all, note the symmetry. A point particle has spherical symmetry. In other words, it is symmetric under any rotation, under any axis through it. It's also symmetric under reflection through any plane that includes the sphere in the plane. And that's spherical symmetry. And so what that tells us is that if we draw a surface around this particle, and this surface is a sphere of some radius r, then the flux is going to be determined by the enclosed charge plus q. But the other thing to note is that by the symmetry, by the rotational symmetry, by the reflection symmetry, we know that the E field magnitude has to be exactly the same everywhere on the surface of this sphere. So now let's apply that same argument 
except to this charged sphere. This charged sphere has its own radius, which I'll call capital R. But we're again going to draw a surface around it, a spherical surface, to match the symmetry of the sphere. The sphere certainly has spherical symmetry. And now all the same arguments apply. This sphere has spherical symmetry, and so its field must have spherical symmetry. And so first of all, that tells us that the field must be perpendicular to the surface of this sphere everywhere, and it must have the same magnitude everywhere on the surface of this sphere, just as it did for this charge. But also, if this sphere has the same charge on it as this particle did, then the flux through this sphere also has to be the same. And that tells us that the number of E-field lines through the sphere is the same, which means the density of E-field lines on the sphere is the same. And since the density of E-field lines is essentially equal, it's really proportional, to the electric field magnitude, that tells us that the electric field magnitude is the same for this sphere as it was for the charged particle at this distance r. And so, with basically no math, we've just shown that the field due to a charged sphere, as long as we're looking outside the charged sphere so that all the charge is inside our surface, is the same as the field due to a charged particle. But we can get one more piece of information out of this simple use of Gauss's law. Let's look at a two-dimensional picture. So here is the spherical surface, and here is the sphere. And let's say that all the charge on the sphere is on its surface, so that in this two-dimensional cross-section, it's all out on this circle here. Now, what happens if we take our surface and we shrink it so that the whole surface is inside the sphere? Once again, the spherical symmetry tells us that any E-field must be perpendicular to this surface and must have the same magnitude everywhere on it. But notice that now, since all the charge is out here on this shell and we're inside the shell, the enclosed charge is zero. And since the E-field has to be the same everywhere on here, the only way we can have a total flux through this surface that equals zero, which is the enclosed charge, is if the E-field here is zero. And so that tells us that the E-field inside the, the spherical shell has a magnitude of zero.